Hello, class. Today I'm reviewing chapter one, Know Your Audience. Now, whenever you start writing for any kind of medium, the first thing you need to do is define your audience. There are four key audience characteristics. We have to look at their demographics, psychographics, geographics, and their behaviors to figure out what medium would work the best as well as what, how to deliver whatever message we need to to our audience. And of course, we'll use all four of these characteristics to develop an audience personality. And what this means is you're basically making an imaginary version of your general audience using these four characteristics. Now, when we talk about demographics, of course, we're talking about some things you usually think about when you think about a person. We're discussing their age, gender, their race or ethnicity, their education, their relationship status, basically any kind of general background stuff you would usually think of when you think about an individual person. These are also things you'll see a lot of times if you take a survey, it'll ask you like, are you married? Are you in a relationship? How many people live with you? All that kind of stuff. And this will be the basis for the majority of, um, of audience personalities whenever we develop that personality profile. And of course, you do have to consider geographics when you talk about an audience personality profile because they have lots of different ways you can group people. Sometimes when you look for news stories or whenever Instagram looks to see if something might be relevant to you or Google or, or any other type of medium, they're going to figure out, well, where do you live? Is this a story that relates to you on a local or national level? Or is this something where you might understand what's happening a little better because of some other audience characteristics? For example, in this picture, we see a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, well, entering the Gulf of Mexico, so it's something that anyone in the Gulf region would find relevant to them. Now, when we talk about psychographics, of course, we're talking about personalities, values. Uh, a lot of times it will also include any activities that people do, maybe if they belong to a particular reg religion or if they hold particular values. It's something that you use whenever, it, it's an, just another part of the story development idea. So an example of when you would use this is if you have an Instagram group for, let's say um, a pro-life group, then that would be something where you might target people who are also part of a Christian organization on Instagram. Or if you have a group of people who are like where you're trying to raise money for a local pet shelter, then you would see if these people, you would target people who also belong to other pet groups. So that's what we're talking about when we are discussing psychographics. And of course, we have behaviors. Now, behaviors are a little different than psychographics because we're discussing things like brand loyalty, or maybe they use something a little more often than another person, or this is like when you go to Target and Target recommends that you buy a particular product because you bought these other things, or when Amazon sends you messages saying, hey, you looked at this product, here are a bunch of other things. Those are all behavior-based marketing strategies. So 
an example of this, of course, which is also kind of a, a geographic one as well, is blue plate ma uh, blue plate mayonnaise. Blue plate is a New Orleans based brand, and most people here are familiar with it. However, if you go to another part of the South, um, for example, I used to live in Orlando, Florida. And at that time, they did not sell Blue Plate at the store over there. But because so many people from Louisiana started moving there, they started carrying it in the store because they recognized the uh, brand loyalty to that particular type of mayonnaise. Now, another way you can group people is also by their shared interests. And when we talk about shared interests, we are talking about foci. Now, what are foci? It's fame, oddity, conflict, immediacy, and impact. Now, all of these elements are things that, in general, people are interested in. Now, how each item is defined may change depending on what group you're talking to. Like if you're talking about people who are interested in Caitlyn Jenner, obviously that would be a different group than people who are interested in uh, like political debates or something, or maybe not. Maybe they have an intersecting area, but the point is you would focus everything based on these elements and how they relate to the other aspects of your audience. So the fame element, of course, we're talking about a person, place, or thing with mass appeal and recognition. This could be a local celebrity, for example, someone like the meteorologist Rob Perillo would be a person with mass local appeal. Uh, a regional celebrity might be someone like Chef John Foss, or if you're a, um, if we're talking about, you know, national or international business leaders, it might be Elon Musk. And of course, these people don't necessarily have to be uh, someone that a person likes, they just have to be recognizable. So if I start a sentence by saying Elon Musk shot another rocket into space, well, that would have a mass fame appeal because people recognize his name immediately, or they'll at least say, hey, I've heard of that person and then Google it and see, oh yeah, he's actually a famous person who did this once already and now he's doing it again. Another example is the is Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. That would be an example of a thing that has mass appeal and recognition. You don't necessarily um, you don't have to be a an art scholar to know that this painting is the Mona Lisa. Now for oddity, we're asking questions like, is it new? Is it an unusual story? How is this story different? This is often a key component when you see a story that would otherwise be considered pretty normal. So if there's a robbery somewhere and the person's wearing a chicken mask or if they drive a tractor into a store, that's considered an unusual thing that otherwise might not be mentioned in the news. A lot of times this would be uh, something you would see on maybe like a Reddit subgroup when they talk about really weird things that happen. This is also something you used to see characterized by the freak show idea. And you can see uh, these two gentlemen here are Siamese twins and they were made famous because of their unusual condition. And we also want to look for conflict. 
when you see a news story, most of the time there is some kind of conflict. It may be external. It might be between different groups of people. Maybe there it's between two sports teams or there's an election. So they have political groups or social organizations who are divided on an issue. Maybe they are two individuals who have a very interesting lawsuit happening. It's, um, it's something, it's one of the components of almost any story, honestly. The majority of stories told have some sort of conflict. I mean, in Romeo and Juliet, not only were Romeo and Juliet trying to get together, but their families were also trying to kill each other. So that's an example of conflict. And of course, we can see here we have a conflict between an umpire and I believe it's one of the coaches for the Rays. And of course, we have an immediacy component as well. Now, immediacy is often a key item in the 24-hour news cycle. This is one of the parts I want you to pay attention to most as you do research for this class. A lot of times, if you enter a particular set of keywords in a search engine, you'll end up with things that maybe happened in 2016 or you know, not during the past few months. So make sure when you're doing research that you find something that happened recently or that was written recently. Think about when you're looking up new types of phones or you're looking up recent trends in a, like in home remodeling, for example, you're looking up something that happened that is going on right now or something that happened in the past couple of weeks. You are not looking for something that happened or was popular in 2010. I mean, no one cares anymore, right? I mean, even if it was something that happened in 2021, they've already had a whole new set of phone uh, updates and announcements and things and no one wants last year's model, right? So keep that in mind as you're researching for your projects and these classes. Most of the time, we're going to look for things that are happening right here or right now, and you want to support those with new information. And of course, we need to have some kind of impact when we are looking for newsworthy items. So we need to explain how does this relate to the audience's life? How will this impact them specifically? For example, when we discuss any kind of uh, interstate or highway development, people need to know, what does this mean for me? Is this going to be a good thing where I'll be able to get to work 10 minutes faster? Or is this a bad thing where my neighborhood is going to be flooded with traffic? So you need to explain how something relates to your audience's life. So look at data statistics, you're going to look at community values, explain, you can even explain things using a, a particular person who is impacted by something. Whenever we talk about coastal erosion, if you look up any stories about it, you'll see they almost always have at least one person who lives on the coast who is talking about how their house is sinking or how they had to move or away from this area where their family lived for 200 years. So you need to have some way to relate it to individual people. Otherwise it's just a bunch of noise. Now here's a foci example. Now this story happened a few years ago, a 10 year old boy in Louisiana was able to deliver his baby brother and save his mother's life during an unexpected breech birth. In the story, she woke up in the middle of the night and she went to go use the restroom. 
and her water broke and the baby's legs came out and she was very obviously panicked. And luckily her son was home at the time and he was able to call 911 and they were able to together him and the 911 operator they were able to uh, get the baby out and help his mom with the delivery so everyone was okay at the end now looking at this story what do you think the foci examples are now Honestly, it doesn't really have much of a fame element, but one way this story did catch the eye of uh, newscasters is it was shared a lot online. Um, a lot of people related to this family shared pictures with their permission, of course, on Facebook and Instagram and everything, and they were able to get the story out about this amazing thing that happened now, the oddity, of course, is a 10-year-old saving his mom's life and his brother's life um, with this particular emergency. Now, this would be considered the key element. So whenever this story was written, that was the focal point that was considered the lead of the story is 10 year old saves his brother and mom in breach birth. Like that's it in a nutshell. So when you're looking for what makes a lead, look at these elements, see which one sticks out as the most important. Like if you had to pick one thing, what is the part you would tell someone that would explain basically the whole story? In this case, it's the 10 year old saving his mom and his brother. And of course, there's a conflict element of the family overcoming these difficult odds. Immediacy, the report came out very soon after it happened. And the impact, of course, this is a very human moment. It has a great personal appeal and it's very uplifting, of course. You know, it's nice to hear when something good like this happens and people want to, to share it and, and have that feel good moment of, yeah, you know, this awesome thing happened. All right, so we defined the audience by market segments. We figured out what their, their audience profile is, looked at demographics, geographics, psychographics, their behaviors. We looked at the foci elements of a story. So we checked if there was any kind of fame component, oddity, conflict, immediacy, impact. And now we're going to look at meeting the audience needs of value, engagement, and action. So question, why should I care? When you look at a story, this is one of the things you need to explain to your audience. You're going to explain it through a kind of personal impact. How does this relate to them? And of course, when you're looking at engagement, we're talking about any audience interests. How is this something that they can engage in? What, um, in what way can they engage with the material? So is it something where maybe you wanna explain a little bit about new uh, tax codes that are coming up? Uh, you want to make sure that you're highlighting how this affects them personally and, of course, what they can do about it and any part of it that would affect them personally. Like, is it something where a large group of people might owe more in taxes or maybe there's a new code that means a bunch of people are going to get money back this year? Think about those things when you're writing your articles. 
And of course, another thing would be if there were any kind of changes in um, hunting or gun laws or everything. Um, of course, I thought the uh, the animals hunting the hunter was uh, was kind of funny. And of course, we're talking about a call to action. So after you develop the value and engagement aspects of your article, we need to create a call to action. Explain how people can engage in the material. What is the next step? So if it's something where a family is struggling, a lot of times you'll include a GoFundMe uh, link. Or if you have a story where they discuss uh, a group of people who have a particular issue, or maybe it's something where people might need to contact a, um, like a state representative, or maybe a mental health facility or something. A lot of times when, whenever you're covering a story, especially crime news, They'll have tip lines at the end, either to help them find someone, or like if you have any information about a missing person, they'll include a tip line at the end so you can call whatever organization is working to find the missing person. And of course, a kind of good general one is if you say, uh, if you have a story that's kind of complicated and it, and you're using it in a, a TV show or maybe on a radio, then you'll say, hey, visit our website and we have even more information about this and you can like find the links to go to all of these different places we mentioned in our story. Now, after you finish writing your articles, I need you to include your sources. Now, when I say include your sources, this isn't just kind of however you want. I need you to follow the American Psychological Association or APA formatting. It's used by a lot of different groups, um, the, usually psychology uh, courses, of course, uh, most of the sociology groups, if you go on to get a master's in communication, you're going to follow APA citation styles. Now, this is only for your references at the end. So this is a list of where you found your information. Whenever you write your articles, you are actually writing out each, um, you're writing the names of your sources in your in your sentence so you would say like bologna says whatever you wouldn't you wouldn't have it in um in parentheses so these things here uh as you would for a parenthetical citation this is a this is information for your reference list at the end and References in APA style follow a kind of general format. It's usually last name, comma, first initial, and then the date of publication, or if there were several updates, it would be the most recent date of publication. Then the article title, the location. In this case, this is formatted from a web page. So the web page name and then the link, or if you're following the journal citation, it would be the DOI number. Now, you, as I said, you do need to include these and they do need to follow the citation style for whatever you're citing. If you're citing a web page, then of course you follow this style. If you're citing a traditional news source, like a newspaper, then you need to follow the newspaper style. You can find all of those, all of this information on the, on the webpage listed here. It's also included in your important links. Please make sure you use this. It's very important that you learn how to create these references 
and follow the correct guidelines. It'll help you a lot as we move along in this course and as you continue your education. I will have a, another lecture later explaining this in more detail, but for now, go ahead and go to this website and see how their, um, how their examples are set up. Click through some of them, see what's different about them, kind of familiarize yourself with it for now, and we'll get into this a little more as the course progresses. Now your homework is to read chapter one and please, if you haven't done so already, review the syllabus. If you have time or feel like continuing um, over the weekend, go ahead and start chapter two. And next Friday on January 21st, your chapter one quiz and your chapter two quiz are both due. I'll go over chapter two next week and have everything posted on Moodle. All right, you guys have a great weekend. Bye.